Hello, everybody. Welcome to part two of our ongoing series of workshops on uh, monitoring report templates. Um, we started last week with an uh, overview of the project and um, the first report, the uh, limitations policy about financial conditions. Today we're going to review the sample reports for asset protection and the planning uh, policies. Um, just real quick for anyone who didn't get a chance to join us last week, I want to remind you um, about what we're hoping to accomplish with this project. First, we want this to be something that works for managers, that you have the tools, um, some ideas, some resources, some examples that you could use, maybe even to plug right into your own reporting um, to make this uh, work easier for you. Um, we had a number of GMs who have made good progress and worked out some neat reporting mechanisms with their boards. Uh, agree to provide some samples of their work. We've incorporated their ideas. Um, they were initially, uh, many of them, initially based on uh, a monitoring set of templates that was developed a couple years ago um, by another group of GMs, some of the same, with Mark Goring. Um, and then we're finding what has worked over the last couple years. Um, what, what are the new ideas? What are the new innovations? Um, this whole series eventually will include a report for each of the C-Build policy templates. Um, they may or may not match exactly with your own board's policies, but there should be enough uh, information there that is very usable uh, no matter what your board's policy is. Um, in all these uh, reports, um, as I was putting together the templates, I, I had these four primary goals in mind. Um, that they actually do what they're supposed to do, which is demonstrate accountability, um, that creating the reports is relatively easy for managers, that this is not something that should take up um, an inordinate amount of, of the, the manager's time on the job, um, and that for the directors, that it's pretty easy for them to look at a report, read it, get the information that they need from it, and be able to make a decision about it. Um, so both that the, the interpretations and operational definitions are really straightforward, and that the data itself is very straightforward. Um, again, all of this for both the manager's benefit and for the director's benefit. I showed this uh, diagram last week, and I just wanted to quickly show it again. This um, is from a survey that uh, our CDS Consulting Co-op did for our clients recently, and this um, shows at least a correlation. There, there's not, not cause and effect here, but at least a correlation between um, the kind of communication um, that boards perceive, uh, at least around ENDS report, and how boards perceive their relationship and managers perceive their relationship with each other. Um, so there seems to be some indicator here that um, good communication through good reporting really is an integral part of that board-manager relationship. So with that in mind, um, I want to just start right in on um, looking at the samples, pointing out a few highlights uh, from them, and offering you the chance if, as we go through to ask any questions. Um, feel free to use the question uh, um, box in your uh, GoToWebinar um, tool sidebar there. Um, if you type in your questions, then when we see uh, you have a question, um, we can give you Joel, who is online as tech support here today, will um, set you up with uh, voice um, privilege so that you can ask your question aloud. I'd really love to, to make this as interactive as um, you care to make it. So I want to um, real quick just go through uh, some of what you see on the, the report on your screen. Some of you who were here last week um, may hear um, some, some ideas repeated, um, but I want to make sure that folks who are just showing up for the first time hear some of the basic um, information. So with all these um, templates, 
I want to remind you that um, these are samples. They aren't intended to tell you as a manager what your interpretation of the policy should be. They aren't intended to be a directive or um, any sort of mandate that you should use these definitions um, or this collection of data. Uh, as always, that decision is yours, the managers. Um, these reports are really intended to be examples, samples of, of what has worked well for other managers that you might also find useful in your own work. A couple of the folks who actually are joining us today are managers who've contributed um, to this project, and I'll, I'll highlight that in a few minutes. So this one, the planning and financial budgeting, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through and point out a few things in particular. If you have questions about what I am pointing out or anything else you see in the report, again, please holler. One of the um, errors that I've, I've seen a number of managers make until they started to understand the point of this particular policy, um, a number of managers were using this to report on current financial conditions. Um, but what uh, we want to show here is that this is a report about um, planning, about looking to the future, about budgeting, not about what's happening uh, in this moment. You'll see up here in this top section, this heading, this format we use throughout the, the templates. Um, right at the top, you'll see a statement in bold where the manager can let the, his or her directors know right off the bat what they should expect to see here. Um, in this case, um, the manager is going to report compliance with all parts of the policy. Um, in the next template, we'll show an example of what happens if the manager is reporting um, some noncompliance. Um, it's dated. What, what period does this cover? The manager signs. Um, not all managers are signing the reports, but it's a nice touch to really give uh, show some seriousness that the manager is standing behind this information. Um, and in this case, the attachments um, are the business plan itself, um, which includes an annual plan, an annual budget. This is all. The, the dates here are uh, again samples. You would date it according to your own work. Um, the attachment, the business plan as an attachment is the supporting documentation. The business plan itself um, is not necessarily written or intended for uh, the directors for the board to review. Um, what we're going to do is show how managers can point out that the plan, the planning that the manager is doing is meeting the board's criteria. So the, the business plan and the budget, all that information is presented as documentation, but is not really the report itself. Um, again, as we go through, feel free to use that uh, sidebar um, question uh, toolbox, toolbox there. You can um, write in your questions. And uh, Joel, whenever you uh, see that it makes sense, feel free to uh, invite someone into the conversation. And I'll keep asking periodically. I'm not going to, as I said, read through all the details here. One of the things I want to point out in this format um, is that right at the very beginning, a, a manager is showing through the operational definitions that um, what is being presented is demonstrating that, in fact, there is a multi-year business plan, that it is updated each fiscal year, and that the plan is aligned to the ENDS policies. So that's, that is really the key of what boards um, would like to see, that there is a plan that the manager is thinking ahead, and that the plan is based on the ends. Um, it might actually be based on other things, too, as you'll see here. It's based on avoiding the fiscal jeopardy conditions. Um, one thing I want to point out in this uh, sample is this idea of using a general manager note. Um, a number of managers, a small handful actually, are using this as a way to point out something specific. It's not actual monitoring data. Um, it's not part of the interpretation or, or uh, definitions. But it's something that the manager really wants to point out to um, his or her board. Um, they, if they are used too much, they really seem to be distracting. But um, occasionally, they are, they're really very powerful. So. This one, the manager is giving a little bit of explanation about what's in the um, 
that supporting documentation, the business plan, um, how it was developed, where it came from. And then uh, this is this very last sentence. Um, I, I particularly liked it came from uh, Clem Nyland, who was one of the contributing managers, who reminded his board um, that the business plan is, is an operational document, that it's not presented for board approval or ratification. Um, and that was a nice, kind reminder to, to Clem's directors that um, what they really, their job was to look at the report and the data here um, and to make decisions about it. They didn't really have to make a decision about the business plan itself, except as it met the criteria. Um, so that was uh, a real nice touch there. Um, here in the uh, first sub-policy, um, a couple things that seem to really be working well for managers um, that I'll point out and you'll see throughout both of these samples today. One is that the operational definitions tend to be very straightforward, very clearly defining what data would show compliance um, so that the interpretation might be a little bit more wordy, it might be a little bit more broadly stated, but then the manager takes that next step down into the detail and says, okay, board, Here's where I'm going to show you exactly what will count as um, achieving uh, compliance with this policy. And then second uh, thing in this section here, you'll see that the data is presented in tabular form, um, that the that a table can often be a really nice way to present uh, the data. Uh, so that it's very obvious, very clear what um, directors should be looking for. So in this case, you see that the, there's a direct comparison being made to the financial conditions and activities. This is what the board has asked for, um, that the plan must avoid those uh, unacceptable conditions. The manager has pulled out the specific conditions that uh, he or she is meeting in the plan, showing them here, and then showing what is actually in included in the plan and where in the plan to find that information. Uh, so for directors who want to go and actually look at it uh, specifically, they can see that. Very nicely presented, very neat, and very obvious uh, whether this is showing compliance or non-compliance. You know, if, if in this case, if Y is not bigger than X, then that would be a non-compliant situation, and the manager would go on from there. So a nice, a nice tool, a nice uh, use of tables to show data. I'm just going to keep scrolling through uh, this. Again, if you see something that you have a question about, feel free to uh, briefly, you don't have to write it out in great detail, write up your question, um, and we'll know that you have a question and invite you into the conversation. Um, one thing that, uh, that uh, these managers who are being successful with their boards and with their reporting are finding is they're not trying to spend a lot of time giving dictionary definitions of the policy. Um, that, that's a, a dilemma that a number of managers have found is they define the words very specifically, but then that doesn't actually help go the next step to create the operational definitions. Um, so uh, a number of managers are finding that in their interpretation they can, again, just give kind of that, um, it's, almost, it's almost like they're saying, here's how I'm thinking about this. Um, when, you, when you say that, here's what I'm hearing from you. Uh, and it's not necessarily meant to be an exact repetition or, or a dictionary definition, um, but just kind of a, a turning it into the manager's language, the manager's thought process. Again, going from the interpretation to the operational definition. Um, in this one in particular, the policy asks for credible projections. And um, this manager uh, has done two things. One, showing that projections are based on historical data and trend analysis. Um, that often makes things credible. Um, but then um, this manager. Uh, added another piece, again, this is not to say that you should do this in your own reporting um, or process, but it was a nice touch um, bringing in third-party verification. So this manager um, essentially tells the board that one of the things that will happen is that the business plan will be reviewed 
um, at two levels by other managers, um, but also by other knowledgeable professionals. And in this case, the manager of this co-op um, actually did choose uh, other managers of other co-ops, um, representatives of NCGA and uh, the uh, bank credit union loan fund that uh, had lent money to the co-op. So this idea uh, for boards to see that, oh, someone else has looked at this, um, there, there's the, the directors themselves don't have to um, necessarily take that whole burden on their shoulders. They've got a broader base of uh, third-party professional support for the plan. So it was a nice touch um, from one of our managers. So again, you'll see that operational definitions, there's, um, I believe in every single case, you'll see for every particular operational definition, there is the exact data to go with it. Now this is not um, in table form, it's written out you know, sentence by sentence. But again, very straightforward, not, not a lot of extra words. Down in um, this one here, this is a policy that uh, none of the samples that were submitted are using this exact policy, but we're using variations of it um, that uh, had managers had some really nice ways of reporting. Uh, so essentially, this is comparing um, the co-op's plan to anything that is any any sort of restrictions placed on the co-op by outside lending agencies. So a number of co-ops that have gone through expansions, relocations, have uh, someone who has uh, loaned money to the co-op, and they're often loan covenants. And so here's what you'll see is um, in this table here that the uh, manager um, in this format here uh, came from Tim Bartlett at uh, Lexington Co-op. Um, this is not necessarily his data, but but this format. Um, where where what are the loan requirements and um, showing both the historical information. Here's what we've done historically, helping boards see the trend, but also primarily focusing on what is the what, what does the budget show? And that's, this is the key sentence here, so that the manager says to the board, there's other information here that's for your information, um, but I am really going to point to you that that's FYI and that the budget itself is what we're talking about here. You will have seen, uh, for any of you who looked at the report last week, you'll see similar things in some of the graphs that we showed. In this case, there are two tables because there's two different sets of criteria that the manager is reporting on. Um, and even though the, the data within the, the, um, the tables looks very similar, um, it's just being compared to different criteria. So you might find you could do that all in one table or that it's easier to show in two different tables. Again, formatting is up to you and your board. What, what is easy, what is clear. Um, here we go. Testing for feasibility. This is uh, one that I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on the details of. Uh, but one of the things that, um, as boards are giving more um, power to managers to really plan ahead, um, if you are beginning to plan an expansion or relocation project or other major project, a board would need to know that that's a feasible plan, that there's, there's some way to, for the board to support it, to sign off on it, to approve the, the loans, whatever it might be. Um, so how would that plan be tested for feasibility? In this case, um, a great way to uh, define what makes something feasible is by, again, relying on a third party, an outside source, and a number of managers and boards and co-ops have relied on the expansion toolbox uh, by Bill Gessner and Mary Corteau. Um, and so you may not provide all that information, um, certainly if there's no plan going on. So in this case, the data is there is no data because there's not a major plan happening. Um, but if there was a major plan, a board would know ahead of time, because this is in their what they're getting in their report, that this is the kind of information that they would be expecting to see. So it helps them as directors um, plan for and think about in advance 
big expansions, maybe even long before there's one actually happening. So a nice, nice touch here to give this kind of information. Again, I remind you, if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to jump in and holler. Um, the last uh, policy provision in, in this planning policy is about boards asking their managers to make sure that the manager is actually budgeting for the needs of the board itself. Um, and a couple things that managers um, have done that seem to be really workable. Um, that the, they point out that adequate funds um, are the board's decision, so the board sets its own budget. Uh, that's generally true. Um, and that the manager's expectation is that the board will submit that budget by a particular date, whatever the date is you would need, so you can incorporate the information into the, your annual budget planning. Um, but then to also say that um, for whatever reason, if the board isn't able to do that, the manager will still budget um, using, in this case, a carryover um, number from the previous year. And then just pointing out that the line item for the cost of governance part of the budget can be found at a particular place and has a certain amount in it. So what you see here is, again, very few words. Um, very powerfully demonstrating accountability for the policy criteria. So that is the sample for the planning policy. Uh, as I get ready to switch over to the, um, what's the other policy we're doing today? The, the asset protection policy. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to uh, ask them, uh, type them in through your toolbar, the GoToWebinar sidebar there, um, and I will uh, continue on with the asset protection policy. So I want to take this moment here. Um, some of the folks who are joining us today are actually uh, managers who contributed their their uh, monitoring reports to this project. Um, and I just want to give a quick thanks to um, the managers who agreed to share some of their information, their, their reporting styles. Um, Tim Bartlett, Glenn Bergman, Kari Bradley, Crystal Halverson, Pam Maynard, Clem Nyland, Rita York. Thanks to all of you for contributing to this project. It's been very educational for me, and I believe so far uh, for other managers who are learning uh, along with us. Uh, so here we go. Compared to the last report we just showed, the, this heading, again, looks very similar. Except in this case, you'll see that the manager is actually pointing out to the board that there is a non-compliant situation. So a director who is sitting at home reading this report before the board meeting, um, maybe out on their porch swing with a nice cuppa, iced tea here on a warm summer evening, um, they'll say to themselves, aha, I better pay close attention to that piece there because I know that as a director we'll have other decisions to make about a non-compliant situation. So right at the top, the, the manager is helping the directors understand what they should be looking for. But otherwise, directors know that now they're going to read this report and expect to see um, accountability that demonstrates compliance. Here, uh, just real quick, I want to point out, if you haven't noticed it already, that the formatting, um, there are a number of ways of highlighting different pieces, uh, whether it's colored fonts, types of fonts, something where there are, there's a distinction where there's a, the manager's clearly pointing out what the interpretation is, what the definitions are, and what the data is. So that, that organization of the report itself um, is not the biggest part of the work, but can help your directors immensely and, and even direct uh, managers as you're writing the report. Um, in this case also, I wanted to point out how there are some samples here, not intended to be 
directives or mandates, again, as I said earlier, of a manager seeing that there are some things that he or she is paying attention to that fall under the, the uh, domain of this top-level policy, but that aren't covered in any of the sub-policies below. And so the manager is going to use this opportunity here for saying two things. Mostly, the manager is going to say is look look for the sub policy, look in the sub policies for detailed information about most things, except for there's two things this manager is paying attention to about assets um, that aren't covered there, and so this manager is showing information about them in this top level policy. In this case, the assets that the manager is showing are protected um, are the retirement plan uh, and deposits of co-op funds, a number of your policies that, that uh, boards have uh, created um, include this one about cooperative funds deposits uh, being insured or protected uh, as a sub-policy. So you might look at this example and see if you can incorporate this into your reporting. Uh, again, a table as a very clear way to present information. Um, here the manager's interpretation has said that I'm going to show you that the financial institution will have a rating ab above a certain level, um, rated by a reputable firm. How much is deposited is the data, um, and how does that compare to the how much is insured? Um, and uh, in this case, one of the deposits, one of the investments uh, in a cooperative fund. A number of co-ops, boards, and managers are finding that that's a valuable part of cooperative principles of supporting other co-ops. So in this one, it, it helps to read the language of the policy carefully. And what uh, I found when I looked at the reports that managers sent in to me was that they had carefully delineated what the different policies were asking for. So in this policy, in this sample template, this is about insurance coverage. So, and it's insurance of equipment and facilities. And so here, a manager will demonstrate that there is sufficient insurance coverage. And in this case, um, the manager will report two definitions. One is that there will be sufficient coverage, and here's the table showing that uh, coverage. And second, that the manager is going to rely on a third party uh, to double check that coverage. And again, this is that, that using third party resources that are considered reliable is a great way for managers to support the reasonableness of their definitions, uh, interpretations, and data. Here, this is not about insurance, but is about, uh, for, well, it is partly about insurance, but first it's about um, exposure. And uh, a couple of the managers who sent in their reports had really clearly and carefully defined what um, avoiding exposure meant. Uh, had some good definitions, mostly about making sure there are good policies and procedures in place. That, that was how they avoided exposure. Um, but then second, that there was also um, insurance for liability. So above was property insurance, and this one is about liability insurance. Okay. Carefully distinguishing what it is we're talking about here. So the first definition about what we do to limit exposure, the second definition about the actual insurance, and here again you see a table. Um, the formatting I'm showing in this one, several different formats for tables, not to suggest that you should use several different formats, um, but just there are different ways managers have found to organize the data, um, and I wanted to give you some examples um, that you could choose among. Uh, so, again, using tables, a nice, what you see here is 
what the insurance is, what does it cover, um, what the amounts are. Very straightforward. The sub-policy about security. Um, this particular style of table I found um, Glenn Bergman at Weaver's Way was using um, several different times using the colors um, just to help make the tables more readable. Um, you'll also see that uh, the table does one thing, which is report about the procedures, but also that um, this manager has said, I'm not going to give you reams and reams of internal operational policies and procedures. Um, I'm just going to tell you that, that we do have them. Here's the ones we have. And if you care to, if you want to have a direct inspection, which many, uh, well, which boards know is an option, very few actually use it, but the manager saying, that's your prerogative. I want to let you know it's all available, but I'm not going to dump a bunch of extra paperwork in your laps. Most directors are very grateful for that. Uh, here we go, protecting data, property, files. Um, the interpretation that seemed to make sense, a um, couple different managers were starting by showing that they weren't necessarily going to give a report about every single iota, every single tidbit of information or data in the COP. They were focusing on um, what they would call either sensitive or, or um, personal, different, different uh, labels for, for what managers were paying attention to. And here, um, this set of uh, definitions seem to be pretty common. Um, how paper records are kept, electronic records, how access is limited. Um, and then, so one is about the procedural stuff that's in place. Um, but then you'll see here a very nice addition that um, there are also not only are the procedures in place, but there aren't any failures of those procedures. Um, and that's a definition that managers hopefully are striving for. And then you could say to your board, hey, look, this year there weren't any failures. I want to point out uh, this one here that um, was a, a, a place where a GM was adding a new definition from the previous report and noted that. So here's a, another GM note where um, the, the GM is pointing out to the board, hey, you all pay attention here. This one's different this year. Here's the place where, because it's different, this is a new definition. Um, this is where the, the data is that the co-op wasn't compliant. Um, and here's a sample then if there's a non-compliant situation where the manager um, provides an explanation and a plan, um, essentially not to try to, to try to de-emphasize compliance and to emphasize that what we want from managers is that they manage. So here's a manager saying we're out of compliance, here's why, and here's my plan for being com becoming compliant. Um, this kind of explanation plan is very valuable for boards, helping them to understand that even in non-compliant situations, they don't have to do a whole lot of extra work about that generally. They just want to know that the manager is still managing the situation. Uh, here about using members and customers' personal information. Um, again, the, the, what seemed to be a really nice way of organizing definitions um, is that there are, one, that there are clear guidelines in place or policies or procedures, um, and second, that there are no violations of uh, this, these policies and procedures. Um, so you'll see that theme throughout. And again, pointing out that I'm not going to give you managers saying to the board, I'm not going to give you this, this whole set of documents, but I want to let you know that they are there in case you ever want to look at them. Here about controlling for purchasing for a conflict of interest. Um, the, most of the managers who submitted their sample reports 
were using a reference to the co-ops auditor. Um, and as long as the, the procedures and processes in place met the auditor's standards, then that was considered uh, compliant. So a variety of ways of saying that. Here's one good example. Um, also pointing out that there are, again, procedures and policies in place and no violations have occurred. Unless, of course, violations had occurred. But it's, but it's both pieces that seem to be very powerful that managers are reporting. One, that we do have the, the policies and procedures in place. And second, that they're actually being followed. And then we come down to um, due diligence. Here was a, a, a nice format for um, a manager pointing out that due diligence might depend on um, the exact contract or the exact acquisition. Um, but I'm going to present the manager saying what, uh, what you should expect to see. So here the, in the interpretation, you might see any of these things. Um, a management team review, legal review, other industry experts. Um, there might be co-op council review. So here, just two samples, one where there was a lease, um, say, for a co-op leasing a site, um, and one for a co-op purchasing a site, a low risk and a high risk. What's the, what's the, what is the risk, and how did we decide if it was um, OK? What was the due diligence? And then what was the decision? Um, I really like this format for reporting this information. It seemed really clear. And you would not report things historical in this format. You, know, you wouldn't report on contracts that were made five years ago or two years ago even, but just on the ones that were in this reporting period. Again, if you have questions about any of these things, feel free to uh, type your question in, and we'll get you on the phone to ask. Um, allowing damage to the cooperative's public image. So a number of boards are asking this, and it's in our C-Build policy template. Um, that's one of our assets, our public image. Um, finding these indirect measures of certain things that are somewhat um, amorphous, like public image, uh, so finding an indirect measure, something that we could actually use as a stand-in for public image, um, seems to be a, a good tool that a number of managers are finding. And so in this case, um, a manager is saying, if we still have as many members as we did before. That is an indication that our public image is OK. If we still have the same number of customers we did before, that's a good indicator that our public image is OK. And thirdly, that if we actually review um, local media, um, we shouldn't see any, any negative reporting about the co-op. So I really like those three um, definitions. Again, you can choose for your own reporting what works for you. Then what you'll see is a good table. You could also use this graphically to show how membership changes over time. Um, in this case, you'll see the numbers uh, growing over time. And uh, that kind of information, seeing those sorts of trends, can be very helpful for directors and managers. So cust members, customers, and then uh, a compilation of media stories. And again, referring to the details are available upon request. But what I'm showing you in this report, the manager is saying, is the high level overall information. So there you go. That's both uh, asset protection and the planning policy templates. Hopefully, you found something here that seems useful for you. I want to. Um, just check and make sure if there's any questions that you want to uh, ask before we sign off, please feel free to. I also want to invite you to um, talk with your fellow managers, any of those managers who uh, I mentioned who had supported this project with their samples, or uh, your favorite C-Build consultant, um, or your own board for uh, which of these formats might make sense for you. So with that, I think that uh, if people had some last minute questions, they can also just raise their hand from the, from the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, 
um, and we can we can turn their mics on as well. If there were any last minute questions from the attendees. All right, sounds like it was all very clear today. That's great. I really appreciate you all coming to join us. We will do this again uh, in a couple of weeks with the next couple of reports. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have those dates right in front of me. Uh, but we'll make sure you know about it. And hopefully you will join us again. And I do hope to see that you've got some of these uh, formatting ideas or data ideas that you can incorporate into your next round of reporting. So good luck with that. Thank you very much. And with that, we will call it a day.